All right, let's bring in our, our Monday morning quarterback on a Tuesday, <laughs> Burt Breer. And Burt, I, I just I was just thinking last night as I was watching Buffalo, I was telling uh, uh, Mike Golick Jr. and Brandon Newman that I, I really haven't thought about a team like this for a long time, a team where I'm really just racking my brain wondering how do you stop how do you stop an offense like this that wasn't even playing at full strength? Like Gabe Davis is an amazing <laughs> receiver too, and he wasn't even there. So, and I, how? That's the question. How do you? How well, the defense. You? Remember that. Remember the defense didn't have Ed Oliver or Tre'Davious White either, and you could argue Tre'Davious White's the best defensive player on the team. So they're loaded. There's no question about it. You know, I, I think he tried to do what the Rams tried to do early in that game, um, you know, in the opener. And I think what the Titans tried to do um, early on in their game, which is try to make them go 10, 12, 14 plays, get them in short yardage situations where they're a little less comfortable. Um, and then, you know, like that naturally will limit their possessions to some degree. The problem is they're getting better at that. And I, and I think that's one of the main things like that I've noticed the first couple of weeks is, you know, I guess if you want to relate it to golf, like Josh Allen's short game's gotten a lot better. And I think having guys like Dawson Knox underneath helps a lot. Um, it's a really, really difficult offense to deal with right now. There's no question about it. And I think you know, the best way to do it is probably try your best to force them to churn out first downs and be consistent. And you, you do that knowing that they've gotten a lot better in those areas. You know, you think back, uh, Bert, to the 2018 draft. And, and we love doing this. I mean, we love the draft. Uh, clearly, uh, the draft gets more and more eyeballs and more and more people are attending the draft in person. Uh, it's one of the great off-season NFL events. But if you go back to 2018 and, and think about, you know, Baker Mayfield going uh, off the top to the Browns, Sam Darnold going to the Jets, and just imagine if somebody else had taken Josh Allen or if the Bills had passed on Josh Allen. It just it just seems so bizarre to think that Josh Allen could be anywhere else. I haven't seen uh, a, a better example of quarterback fitting system and city and mentality more than, than Josh Allen with the Bills. I mean, it's hard to imagine him anywhere else, isn't it? I mean, it's almost too good to be true, right? Like you think about like just sort of where he's from in rural California and then, you know, going to school at Wyoming. And, you know, I, I remember talking to people before the draft who said like, I, I, like, I don't know if this kid can handle going to like a New York, like Sam Darnold, who is from Los Angeles, winds up in New York and at the time. Like, I think a lot of people felt like, oh, like that's perfect. You know, Sam Darnold, the big city kid goes to the big city and Josh Allen, who's sort of from the middle of nowhere, winds up in Buffalo, makes all the sense in the world. Um, you know, so I think that part of it really worked for Josh. And I, I think it worked like for more than just like that aesthetic reason. I, I think it also worked for development reason for development reasons. Josh Allen needed work. Um, and I think he'd tell you this. He needed to get more accurate. His mechanics needed work. Um, and this was a kid who just needed to play. You know, he needed to get out there and kind of deal with the bumps. And I just think being in that environment in Buffalo probably helped him in that, you know, if he's in New York playing for the Jets, say the drafts, the, the, the Jets take him third overall instead of Sam Darnold, you know, they're litigating his play on a, on a day-to-day and a week-to-week -week basis. Me and you know that, you know, uh, Michael, we live in that environment in New England, you know? And I think in yeah. Buffalo being in an environment where it was a little bit more low key and, you know, his career wasn't going to be assessed on a week-to-week -week basis, I probably really helped the bills develop in the right way. And so they were able to get him out there and keep him out there. And, you know, he gets to keep playing he gets to keep fighting through his mistakes. And the sky isn't following every five minutes, you know, because he threw an interception here or fumbled on a run there. You know, I think it really allowed him to kind of take his development in a step-by-step -step basis. And it allowed the bills to do it in a step-by-step -step way too. Um, yeah, I really think that that's a part of it, you know, and, and would it have made or break, what would it, was it a make or break thing? I don't know, you know, probably not, but I certainly think it helped. Bert, they've done an incredible job. I think just in con in context, you look at a team that is building, you're trying to build a championship team. That sounds great. We always talk about it. Okay. We got to mm -hmm. build a championship team. How about trying to build a championship team when you are in the same division 
with a perennial division champion where uh, they don't even the Patriots and their fans got to the point where they started to mock winning the AFC East yeah. title. Like, of course, of course, we're going to win AFC East. We're thinking about something else. We're thinking about Super Bowl. So you're trying to build as they're still going and you draft Josh Allen. Great draft choice. You mm -hmm. trade for Stefan Diggs. Great trade. You bring in, uh, you know, Micah Hyde. Great free agent signing. Jo uh, you know, now Von Miller. Great. You, you think about all the stuff that they did. The draft picks, the signings, the trades. They checked. You know what's about checking a lot of boxes. They checked like two or three boxes, like per line. They. Yeah. It really it was a masterclass, Bert, in in team building from not so great team to borderline champion, uh, borderline champion. You know what I love about it too, Michael, is like we always focus on like the coach and the GM and the quarterback, right? Like, but this really is about like the depth of the organization and they put like good people around Josh Allen. They built through the lines of scrimmage. Um, they did things the right way. They got good quality people in there as leaders. So Josh wouldn't have to lead right off the bat. Like that was one of the things that was really important to them was allowing him to develop at a reasonable pace. And so what do they do? They go and find outstanding leaders for the locker room. Guys like Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer, who they know could, who they knew could carry the load. They held on to Kyle Williams for a couple of years. You know, so when, when Josh Allen got to Buffalo, Kyle Williams was still in that locker room. And, you know, so it was outstanding people in the locker room on the coaching staff, you know, bringing in Brian Dayball, getting him out of Alabama, having Leslie Frazier there as the defensive coordinator. And then God, the personnel department, like Joe Shane, you know, now he's the Giants GM. Brian Gain goes to Houston. He winds up coming back. They've got some younger guys in the in the in the pipeline night now that are coming up and Terrence Gray and Malik Boyd. Dan Morgan, you know, he's another one. He's the assistant GM now in Carolina. It's not just the people at the top. It's the ability of those people to identify more people that would make the organization deep. And I think that sets them up long-term too. Like that's why there's younger guys in the pipeline. I mentioned Gray and Malik Boyd on the personnel side coming up to replace guys like Morgan and Shane leaving. Well, then, you know, you look on the coaching side, Ken Dorsey's ready to go, right? Like, so Ken Dorsey is there when Dayball leaves. And if Ken Dorsey leaves, well, now they've got Joe Brady in the pipeline. So I think it's a really good example of how it's not just about a couple people. It's about finding a way to make sure the right people are at every level of your organization. I think the Patriots were great at that for a lot of years. It's why they been they were on the on top of the AFC East for so long. And I think Buffalo is set up in a similar way right now. All right. Now, obviously, we talk about the quarterback. Most franchises say if we got a star quarterback. We got a chance. How about a, the, the, a different line of thinking, though, that we're seeing in Philadelphia in Miami. Mm -hmm. I, I know Miami is just one. It's just one great Sunday afternoon for Tua, but but neither Tua nor Jalen Hurts really recognize as a top 10 quarterback. Nobody said, mm -hmm. hey, this guy's a top 10 quarterback in the league, but they give Jalen Hurts some help on offense. They give Tua some big help, some fast help on offense. And all of a sudden, you know, these these franchises and these quarterbacks look a little different. Maybe is that the newest uh, is that the newest direction to go Bert? Look, hey, we can't get a franchise quarterback without right. selling out our entire organization. But what we can do is overpay and go out and, and get some yeah. big time weapons and maybe we can get we can get to a championship path that way. That works when they're on a rookie contract, you know, like while they're still not making very much money now. The question becomes like, can they level up when you get to year five, year six, year seven, when all of a sudden now that guy's making a ton of money and it's going to be up to that guy to make up the difference, you know, and whatever it is, 35, $40 million difference between what they're making is on their rookie contract and what they wind up making on a veteran quarterback contract. So no doubt, like, you know, Miami and Philly, I think are doing the right thing and loading up while they can, while they've got their quarterbacks on rookie contracts. The problem is eventually the dynamic changes there. And I, I think, you know, you've seen some impressive improvement from both those guys. I mean, Tua, I think having, you know, the right environment there now, I think Mike McDaniel's done a good job of sort of preparing some of the hurt feelings in that building. Um, you know, and then I think that, 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 that they built in a way, not that Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle wouldn't work for all quarterbacks, but 
you know, kind of they, those guys uncover quickly and allow Tua to play a faster game, which is what his game was at Alabama. I'm actually more impressed by the, the improvement we've seen from Jalen Hurts. Here's the reason why, Michael. He's improved in areas where you generally don't see quarterbacks improve. Like his pocket presence has gotten better. Usually that doesn't change much. His anticipation has gotten better. Usually that doesn't change much. His accuracy has gotten better. Usually that doesn't change much. And so I look at Jalen Hurts and I, you know, watching him last night, it's just, yes, a lot's right around him, but you sort of wonder where the ceiling for him might be because like mm. he's made improvements in areas where you generally don't see quarterbacks get a lot better. Like the reasons why, like when he was in Alabama, some people thought he wasn't going to be even playing the position in the NFL. Like some teams were like legitimately evaluating him as a running back when he was in Alabama. Wow. You know, now you see him and he's improved in areas where you generally don't get improvement from quarterbacks, which is just, I mean, it's mind blowing. It's a great credit to Jalen Hurts. It's a credit to the people in e with the Eagles that have helped bring him along. Um, son of a high school football coach, I guess, like, you know, part of it is that you just got like a really high aptitude for the game and, and maybe you can make improvements in areas where other people can't improve. Um, but it's been eye opening to me and I know it's been eye opening to people who know a lot more about football than I do too. Well, I'll get you, uh, I'll get you, uh, uh on the way out with this thought. You, know, you said to me, I think it was last week or the week before that if you're looking at dark horses, in the league for for championships for the for a Super Bowl appearance, you were going with Philadelphia. You said that before last night. Mm -hmm. I guess last night didn't really change, didn't discourage you from that view. <laughs> you look at Philly as okay, but that's tough though. You think about Philly still got the Rams to deal with, even though they look shaky on Sunday. You got the Rams, you got the Buccaneers. Yep. Packers aren't going anywhere, but you like the Eagles. Uh, or you wouldn't be surprised to see the Eagles come out of the uh, out of the NFC. Yeah, I have the Packers winning the NFC, um, and I and I think like I feel better about that after Sunday. To be honest with you, like I think this might be the best combination of run game and defense Aaron Rodgers has ever had. I also think they're sort of using that calculus that if you've got a great quarterback, you can use the first few weeks of the season to sort through things. And they've done that by getting David Bakhtiari and Elkton Jenkins their two tackles fully healthy like Jenkins came back last week missed week one which I think was a big deal um, back Tiari will be back I think in the next few weeks so they've used it to kind of get those guys healthy they've also used it to get the rookie receivers help some reps and so you know where Romeo Dobbs and, and Christian Watson might be costing them right now as they sort of learn as they go along the Packers think by getting them that work it's going to wind up really benefiting the team in November and December and help them you know, make up for the void that's created by, by, by Devonte Adams. But I mean, I'll tell you this, like you just look at that defense with seven first round picks starting and the run game, the way it looked with Aaron Jones and, and AJ Dillon on Sunday, I think they, 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 they can ask less of Aaron Rodgers now because they're so good in areas outside of just the offensive passing game. Um, yeah. And then I mean, Philly, I think you look at it and, and this is the logic I use to call them a dark horse in 17, not to bat myself in the back, but I did think they were a dark horse that year too, is strength on the lines of scrimmage. You know what I mean? Like they are so strong on the lines of scrimmage and it's a real rarity. If you look at like their roster, right? They've got four guys, two on each side of the ball in those positions who have a decade in the league and with their team as Lane Johnson and Jason Kelsey on offense and then Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham on defense. It's remarkable that you'd have that level of experience and that at, at that sort of talent level on the lines of scrimmage. And on top of that, they've got a lot of other good players in those areas too. And generally I think it's a good rule of thumb for everybody. If you have strength in the lines of scrimmage, you're going to be in every single game. It's like why I think Detroit's going to be pretty good when we get to the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Philly's got strengths in the lines of scrimmage. And, you know, obviously you look at the way, you know, in areas outside of that one where Darius Slay and AJ Brown are making plays for them now. Um, yeah, I think Philly is going to probably win the NFC East and be an 11, 12, one team when all is said and done. Bert overall, it was an enjoyable weekend of football. I guess if I really had to complain about anything, it was the Buckeyes giving up 21 points. Uh, giving 21 points. Scored 77, I know, they sco I know they scored 77. Uh, I was looking for a, a, a more stout defensive performance from my Buckeyes, but they got I'm Wisconsin. With you. I'm got with Wisconsin you. I, I will say this. Saturday. That Toledo quarterback's a real dude. 
I think his name is Daquan Finn. All right. So just kind of file that name away. Like, I think that was part of it. Like, I'm not saying it's totally excusable 21 points against Toledo. Both you and I know that's not good enough, but I do think that quarterback they have is a real dude. We may see him in the transfer portal. Maybe we'll see him in the big 10 or the sec somewhere next year. And uh, you're feeling good about the Wisconsin game on Saturday. I feel pretty good. I think we're okay. Okay. You? All right. All right. You? No, I, I mean, know, CJ I just, looks sharp. Look, CJ looks Bert, sharp. And I Bert, know it's Toledo. CJ. You know this. As an Ohio State fan, there are two schools that you look at. Well, no matter what the situation, you say, okay, watch out for them. One is Michigan State. We got PTSD. Yeah. Michigan State has ruined some dreams for us. And Wisconsin has done the same thing. So Wisconsin, yep. Michigan State. I'm always just kind of looking at them, even if they're not that good. Yeah. Got my they got, and they got that massive running back, too. I don't know. Like, I, I, like Braylon Allen. Like, I mean, he's like 255. Like, as always, they've got the Wisconsin's had like 20 back. of those guys. Yeah. They always do. They That's got the big corn-fed lineman and just the huge, <laughs> like, physical running back. <laughs> I will say Bert, this. Like, there's no guys. school. There's no school where, like, the football identity and the basketball identity matches up better than Wisconsin. Like it's like they're the That's same right. team in those sports. I don't know about other sports, but in those two sports, it's like they're the same team. That's true. And I hate that big W on their helmet too, just aesthetically. Yeah, it like looks it. like a relic of the nineties, doesn't it? With the shadow on it and everything else. Yeah, it, it taunts me. Taunts and haunts. Thanks, Bert. Thanks, Michael. Hey, thanks for watching Brother From Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.